from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of IBM Think 2021. Brought to you by IBM. Hello everybody, welcome back to IBM Think 2021, the virtual edition. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm pleased to welcome back a longtime Cube alum, Jim Whitehurst, who's the president of IBM and I'll call him chief cultural evangelist. Welcome Jim, great to see you again. Great to see you, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's really our pleasure. And, and I, I want to start off, it's, it's just over a year uh, as president of IBM. I, I wonder, you know, when you're a little kid or you know, early in your career, computer science class, did you ever think you'd be president of a company that was founded in 1911? I mean, amazing. I wonder if you yeah. could share, what's the most important thing you've learned in your first year? Well, well look, I mean, I, as you said, I, I would have never thought it. You know, I was the first kid to have an IBM PC on the block and was always into technology, but never saw myself as like, you know, you know running a big tech company. So uh, it is humbling. Um, I would say that there are tons of lessons in the first year. I guess the two that strike me most is, one is just related to strategy. And that's, you know, at Red Hat and it's most technology companies, we're very customer focused, but it's around, you know, whatever technology we're bringing to market, where IBM has fundamentally transitioned, and, you know, kind of transformed itself over time to make sure it can meet customer needs. So it's sold off businesses, it's bought other businesses, it's created new businesses. So it really shows the kind of the, the focus and value on serving our customers and doing whatever it takes to do it. And that's been a fundamental kind of different strategy that most companies have, have had. And I think one of the reasons that we've been around for over a hundred years. The second is, you know, I'm, I'm deeply into culture and I've talked a lot about the difference of running Red Hat that's all about innovation versus, you know, Delta Airlines where I was before, which is driving efficiency. IBM is both. And so really trying to think through how you run an organization that needs to run the financial systems of the world at extraordinary reliability and drive roadmaps on things like quantum computing. At the same time, be able to innovate iteratively you know, with our customers and in open source communities and kind of getting that balance right as a leader. It's a, it's, you know, you kind of doing what, what we did at Red Hat and what we did at Delta, but kind of doing it together. And I think that stretched me as a leader and kind of taught me a lot about how we're thinking about continuing to evolve the culture at IBM. Now, of course you do this leadership series, you put it out, things out on LinkedIn and you know, words matter. And that's what I take away from a lot of the little short hits that you do, which I really appreciate. My stuff that I put Jim on, on LinkedIn is just, you got to invest like 15, 20 minutes. So I really appreciate the short hits, but, but you do that regular series. And I, I'm kind of curious, do you do that to reach more IBM people, do you, are you, are you open source culture, you're trying to help others. Uh, uh, and I, I'm curious as to sort of why that platform as opposed to sending around an internal thing on, on IBM. And, and, I, and I'm wondering if your principles and how they've evolved kind of post pandemic. Well, look, uh, so first off, um, maybe that comes from Red Hat, but I think IBM shares that it's, you know, if you have something really, really valuable, you want to share it. And look, when I am out talking to our customers, CEOs of some of the biggest companies in the world, honestly, we rarely talk about technology because other people are more detailed uh, or deep in that. We primarily do talk about culture and how you think about, again, how do you take an organization that's been built to drive efficiency and scale on a global basis and make it able to be more nimble and more innovative. And so, you know, and obviously, hopefully that's all with IBM and Red Hat Technologies, but ultimately most of my conversations at a senior leadership level are about culture and leadership style to drive that. Uh, and so if that's valuable for CEOs of some of the world's largest companies, it's valuable to leaders, you know, kind of across all spectrums, all sizes. And so I think that LinkedIn is a good way to kind of take some of those messages uh, and make sure we were able to share those much more broadly. So certainly I spend more time talking about it inside of IBM and I spend a lot of time with our clients talking about it. But I think those, uh, many of the lessons are uh, applicable more broadly. And so why not share them? And LinkedIn's a great platform to be able to do that. How about your, how have your principles, uh, have your principles sort of changed and uh, how have they evolved post pandemic? Well, I think a couple things. So one is the pandemic kind of forces you to get more precise about it. And what I mean by that is, you know, so much of leadership is about building credibility and trust and influence. And, you know, when you're seeing someone in 3D live, you know, visual cues can kind of mean a lot and the water cooler conversations or, you know, who you run into in the hall can all help kind of create that level of trust and 
Um, but you can't do that in 2D, you know, as great as, you know, Zoom and uh, other platforms are, you just can't quite do it. And so you have to be much more thoughtful in how you're creating opportunities to kind of create trust. So I'd say well, I've gotten more surgical in thinking about kind of what those elements of leadership are that do that. I think the second thing I've really learned at IBM, again, is back to this, you know, we have to be able to do both kind of drive kind of a future state in a known world, as well as I call it seek a future state in an unknown world. So, you know, driving a roadmap for quantum computing takes a number of different technologies coming together in one year and two years and five years. And that really does have to be pre-planned, which is very, very different than I'll call the iterative innovation approach that, you know, we use at Red Hat and open source communities and working with our clients. And we have to do both. And so as a leader, you really have to understand the problem you're trying to solve and there and apply slightly different kind of leadership tactics against that. So when you're executing a known versus you are trying to create something in an unknown does require different approaches. And we have to do both in IBM. And I think that's the struggle a lot of companies have. Every company needs to do that. You know, if you're Delta Airlines, you, you know, you don't want anybody innovating on the safety procedures before your flight, yet you want a lot of innovation happening on your website and your mobile app. So how do you bring those together? And as a leader, you can have a common set of values, but recognize you have to bring different tools to the table depending on the context in which you're leading. And so I've learned a lot more and gotten a lot crisper with that since being at IBM. Interesting, I mean, the pandemic, we all know it's been terrible, but but one of the, the upshots has been we, we had a glimpse of the future sort of shoved into a forced march of digital in, in 2020. Um, and, and, and so, it, it, you know, obviously the next 10 years ain't going to be like the last 10 years. And one of the things we've been talking about is ecosystems and partnerships and the power and leverage that you can get from those. And Arvind has said, you know, laid it out, we are a returning to growth company. And so I wonder if you could talk to how partnerships and ecosystems play into that return to growth for IBM. Well, you know, first off, a key part of our strategy, we talk about hybrid cloud and AI, um, it's not just about, uh, hey, a, a platform that runs across, you know, all the different deployment models is convenient. It's also because innovation is coming from so many sources today. It's coming from, you know, a byproduct from the Web 2.0 companies. It's coming from open source. It's coming from a, an explosion of startups because of the amount of capital in, the, uh, in, in venture capital. It's coming from traditional software companies. It's coming from our clients who are participating in open source. And so you have so many sources of innovation. Much of what we're doing is landing a platform that allows you to consume innovation safely and reliably from wherever it's coming from. So a core part of a platform by definition is the ecosystem around it. You know, having a platform that runs everywhere is great, but if you don't have any applications that run on it, you know, who cares? And so ecosystem and partners have always been important to IBM, but for this strategy of this horizontal platform oriented strategy, it is critical to our success because much of the platform is the ecosystem. And so, you know, we've already talked about, you know, investing a billion dollars in that ecosystem to get ISVs and other partners on our platform, again, to ultimately kind of create that kind of horizontal layer where you know I can run anything that I want to on it and I can run that anywhere I want to. And so the two sides of that, so all the innovation happening on top and making sure it runs everywhere is what really unlocks the freedom of choice that reduces friction to innovation which allows everybody in the ecosystem from our clients to ISVs to hardware partners to innovate more quickly. And that's what we really see as the benefit of our platform. It's not a horizontal stovepipe, come innovate in this one place. It's recognizing innovation is happening so many places. And the only way we're going to be able to allow people to ingest that is to have a horizontal platform that everyone's participating in, which is why partners and ecosystem are so important, not only to the success of our platform, but to the, I'd say, success of this next generation of computing these horizontal fabrics that require an ecosystem kind of built around them. I think that's an important nuance that maybe people don't understand that, that yes, you have a platform, obviously OpenShift is a linchpin, but it's an enabler for people to build other platforms. It's not the be all end all platform. It's sort of ultimately becomes, you know, another island. And so that, that is a, a key part of the growth strategy and presumably expands your total available market. Oh, absolutely. And so this is the key is, you know, we can talk about great IBM technologies, you know, we're doing amazing things in security and, you know, AI and, you know, natural language processing and all these other areas. But the platform is a recognition that 
we're not going to do everything for everybody anymore. There's just the democratization of technology means that there is so many sources of innovation. And so first and foremost, we have to land a platform so you can consume anything from anywhere. And then of course, we'll drive our own pace of innovation, both in you know hardware and in software um, around that platform. But we are just a player against uh, on that platform where which we're really instantiating for really anybody to be able to reach customers or customers to reach you know, sources of innovation. I know sustainability is a, a, a passion of yours and it's obviously a hot topic right now. I, oftentimes I joke tongue in cheek, Mil Milton Friedman's rolling over in his grave with all this ESG talk. Uh, and I know you just posted recently on LinkedIn and of course I went right down to Kavanaugh because my premise is not only is sustainability the right thing to do, it's also good business. But I wonder if you could you know, give us your perspectives on this. Yeah, well, so first off, I mean, as a large global citizen of, as, as IBM, I think this is an important role that we play. And look, this isn't new to IBM. We came out with our first statements around environment in 1970. We put out our first report that's become our environmental impact report in 1990. Uh, you know, we've been talking about climate since the early 2000s. So we've been involved in this for a long, long time. Um, because I do think it's important broadly, but there's also a specific role I think IBM can play beyond, you know, just our own individual actions to reduce our own footprint. You know, we, because of some of the extraordinary technologies that IBM is, has worked on in the years, especially around semiconductors, we have just a, an amazing amount of technology, expertise, intellectual property around material science. And so, you know, just a couple examples of those uh, that relate to the environment. We, we, in doing some other work, realized that we had a way to be able to recycle PET plastic, which is a real problem because so many clothes and other things are now made out of PET. And it's really hard to recycle, but a byproduct of other work we're doing, we realized we could do that. And so we formed a, a JV and we're funding that to, you know, not, profit from it, but to make sure that much more of the world's PET is recycled or the work that we're doing on batteries where, you know, using ocean water instead of rare earth minerals uh, to make batteries uh, that uh, not only are cleaner, but last longer. Those are kind of byproducts of our kind of core business, but areas that, you know, we can see the benefits of innovation and material science being able to impact the world. I am hopeful that we'll be able to play a role with all of that in, in clear air carbon capture. I mean, that's still far further away, but I do think uh, IBM has a unique role that we can play because of our deep expertise in, again, material science, quantum computing and modeling um, that uh, put us in a unique position to have a major impact on the world. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about <clears throat> sort of IBM and its, and its technology bets. And, and I've made the point a number of, of year, you know, times in my writing that IBM's R&D spend has been about pretty constant, about $6 billion a year. But as IBM has jettisoned certain businesses, got out of the x86 you know, server business, it, it got, you know, got out of the foundry business with microelectronics, now it's spinning out Nuco. What happens, the effect is that R&D as a percent of revenue goes way, way up. And my premise has always been that allows IBM to be more focused. So whether it's hybrid cloud, AI, quantum, edge, where are you placing your technology bets and, and maybe give us a sense of how you rank them, some of your favorites. Yeah, so look, uh, th that's exactly right. I mean, we are one of the few places that still invest a massive amount in R&D, especially in, in, in fundamental research. And so, you know, I'll kind of break down kind of the, the core area. So first off, what I'd say is part of the hybrid cloud platform is recognizing we don't need to do everything for everyone. There is great, you know, open source technology. There are great other vendors that are doing things. Um, that we can uh, enable our, 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 our customers to access via the platform. So, you know, we're not trying to do everything for everybody uh, in the way maybe, you know, 40 years ago we did because we understand there's so much great other technology out there that we're going to make sure that we expose. So we're investing in areas where we think we can uniquely add value that need to happen that others aren't doing. Um, so uh, AI, let me take that as an example. There's tremendous work happening in machine learning, you know, that we see every day because of, you know, Facebook and people trying to identify cats. And so, you know, I don't mean to trivialize it, there's a tr phenomenal work happening there. There's a lot less work uh, being done on, in AI on things where you have a lot less data 
or areas where you need explainable unbiased AI. And the problem with machine learning engines is, you know, they're not auditable by definition. That's kind of a black box. And so we do a lot of work in areas like that. We do a lot of work in natural language processing. So, you know, we've had more of a, uh, as a um, kind of publicity kind of push the technology, something called Project Debater, where you know uh, Watson can debate kind of champion debaters. That was mainly to make sure we can understand language in context, um, which allows for being able to better handle call centers uh, in areas like that. Allows us to understand source code, which helps us think about how you migrate applications from you know on-premise to the cloud. So we have a bunch of AI things that we are doing and is a core focus of what we're doing. But in, uh, specifically, we're investing in areas like anti-bias, auditability, natural language processing, areas where others aren't, uh, which is unique. And we can bring those capabilities together with what others are doing. Security, obviously huge, huge area where you know, we've invested in you know, quantum safe encryption. We've invested in confidential computing. In other words, even in compute mode, your data is, uh, is encrypted. Um, so you can keep your own keys. So not, e not even we on our cloud can see your data. So a lot of investments happening around security and that's gonna continue to be an area as we know that's gonna get more and more and more scrutiny. So heavy, heavy focus there. Um, heavily focused on technologies that help you kind of modernize your infrastructure. So automation tools, um, you know, integration tools and areas around that. So on the software side, those are kind of the, the main areas. When you look on the hardware side, obviously quantum uh, is a significant area um, where we have a leadership position we continue to drive, but even semiconductor uh, research uh, in, in uh, kind of process um, technology. So, you know, we announced something with Intel to uh, work with them to bring some of our process technologies as we kind of go from seven nanometer to five to two to ultimately one, you know, that set of technologies uh, is an area where we have a real leadership position and you will continue to work with now Intel to continue to work with others to, to drive that forward. Um, so a whole bunch of areas, both on the hardware and the software side that we continue to make progress on. Yeah, the silicon piece is interesting. We saw that, uh, that with Arvind as uh, part of the Intel announcement. We, said, we thought originally, oh, maybe this is just about quantum, but it's really much more than that. You mentioned the process. We dug into it and we realized, wow, we said Power 10 actually has the highest performance and be, because of the way in which you are not to geek out, but you're, you disaggregate memory and Pat Gelsinger talked about system on a package. It turns out folks that IBM is actually the leader in that type of capability. Uh, so the way that systems on chips use memory is very inefficient, but IBM has actually invented some techniques to make that much more efficient. That sort of the future of semiconductors and the reason why we spend so much time thinking about it is because it's of national interest. You know, there's a huge chip shortage which doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. So that's a critical part of, you know, national competitiveness and technology competitiveness going forward. Well, and the other interesting part about that, you talked about Power 10, you know, going back to the hybrid cloud platform that we talked about, it's not just about running applications across wherever you want to run them. It also abstracts the chip architecture. So all of a sudden, whether it's on the mainframe, it's on power, it's on ARM, it's on x86, and a whole bunch of other technologies that might get developed, we're making it much easier to kind of consume that specialization or variety at the hardware level. Recognize as Moore's law runs its course, there's no longer this inevitability of everything's just going to go to x86. I think we are going to see more variety because we're going to have needs in, in the factory floor or in the automobile or with you know massive containerized applications where you're going to need whether it's kind of shared memory or different architectures all the way out to kind of low battery uh, consumption, you know, and that whole kind of breadth. And our hybrid cloud platform enables that variability. And then IBM obviously has great technology to enable kind of building unique capability in hardware. So we kind of play on both sides of it, both kind of developing great technologies, but then making it really easy for developers to consume and, and, and use those specialized features. I'm glad you brought that up, Jim. We mentioned Moore's Law, because we all talk about how Moore's Law is waning and it's quote unquote dead. But the reality is, is the outcome of Moore's Law, which is the doubling of performance every two years is actually accelerating because of the combinatorial factors of CPUs and GPUs and NPUs and accelerators and DSPs. If you add all those up and actually, we're actually, quad, we're actually quadrupling every two years. So we have more processing power at much lower cost because of the volumes that you're seeing on things like ARM. So it's actually a very exciting time. We're entering an era 
that you know, we really, it's hard to get your mind around sometimes. So, so my, my question is, what, what, what should we, how should we think about the future um, a, a state of IBM? What does that look like? Well, look, I, you know, so f first off, um, the thing that I found extraordinary about IBM, kind of having been there now just a little over a year as, as an employee, a cu couple of years, I guess, is when it's Red Hat was, was acquired, is it is unique in fundamentally changing, again, who we are to kind of meet the needs going forward. And if you think about the needs in technology, recognize it was only what 20 years ago that Nicholas Carr wrote his famous article, IT Doesn't Matter, it's about back office. You know, and in that world, IBM was really, really effective at building and running IT systems for our clients, right? We would come in, we would just kind of do everything for, uh, for them. Today, you know, technology is at the forefront of developing or, or, or building competitive advantage for almost any business. And so nobody wants to kind of hand the keys, you know, so we no longer necessarily doing things for our clients, we're doing things with our clients. So there's a whole set of work that we haven't even talked about, about how we engage with our clients, how we're much more collaborative and co-creative in our whole garage model to help um, build the capability to innovate, you know, kind of with our clients is a key part of what we're doing. We'll continue to drive, you know, core technologies forward like quantum and, uh, and kind of key areas that require billions of dollars of research that frankly no one else is willing to do. And then we bring it all together with this hybrid cloud platform where we recognize it's no longer about us doing it all for you anymore. We're going to do uh, the things where we can uniquely add value, but then provide it all on a platform which allow you to consume from wherever, however you want to in a safe, secure, reliable way. So as we watch this next generation of computing unfold, cloud shouldn't end up being a bunch of vertical stovepipes. It truly needs to be kind of a horizontal platform that allows you to run any application anywhere in a safe, secure, reliable way. And our architecture helps do that. So it's no longer, hey, we'll do everything for you. It's we can do things uniquely um, on a platform and work with you to be able to help you kind of create your own pace of innovation, your own sources of advantage. And so that's the broad kind of uh, direction that we're going. Again, as enterprises move from consuming technology to be more efficient to driving advantage with it, they need partners who understand that focused on their success and can, can innovate with them. And that's really where we're going with our technology, with our services capability, and kind of our, our, our approach to how we work with our clients. Yeah, Jim, you just laid out the holy grail of computing in the next, in the coming decade and with IBM's acquisition of Red Hat, and it really enables that, that vision. And clearly the company is, is one of the top few that are in a position to do that. Jim Whitehurst, thanks so much for coming back in theCUBE. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, it's great to chat. All right, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there for more content of theCUBE's coverage of IBM Think 2021, the virtual edition. Be right back.